Welcome to Knocked Buff and Pilot with Penny Bradley. And today is my guest, Matt Tracy. And we decided to discuss his, his background in the Draco and Nachtwaffen rather than get deeper into German science. So um, Matt has a very different background in, in the SSP than most of the rest of us. And uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, um, just so everybody understands for some reason that altar ever since that last interview that altar is just too far away the i watched the interview and half of it i didn't remember so we're just going to move on to something else that i can talk about right now um altars are like that yeah and when he gets too far away suddenly my understanding of things just I feel like I'm having a brain fart all the time when I try and think about that stuff. So, uh, where should I start? Um, How old were you when you were first taken, as far as you remember? I was very little. Um, recently, I've come to understand that the Draco took me before the CIA ever did. Um, they programmed an altar. The guy I've always called Spartan because I had no other name for him. Um, I, didn't, I don't know any of the names of my altars except for now because a Draco came to me a month ago or so, some, somewhere around then. Um, she was doing something in my room. Um, I woke up to it and it was weird. She, she was, she puts her hand, like we're talking about my, my head fits pretty much on between two fingers, but she basically puts her hand on my head and uh, see if I can remember properly. She says something to the effect of, and I'm, it's, it's, it's English words, but it's in my head. It's like, I'm hearing them audibly, but she's not speaking. Okay. So that's kind of how it how telepathy. It is. Yeah. Um, she says, um, I don't even remember what she said. <laughs> well, that helps. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to remember so hard. Um, I hadn't thought about it since I uh, since I did, did the interview on I, I did a 30 minute on our 20 30 minute on um, I'm having some serious brain farts lately. My brain's just not working. Um, anyway, I'll try to push through it. So she's doing all this work and um, um, she's trying, she just basically, you know, like, oh, I remember now. It's just like, they're there, my child. And I start freaking out. I'm not your child. You're not my mama. I know my mama. She's not, not a Draco. <laughs> and, and she's all like, um, she starts calling me Michael and my middle name is Michael. My dad's name is Michael, but I'm like, my name isn't Michael. And she goes, um, that's what we call you. Um, she, ah. you know, something along the lines of the altar that she had a hand in creating is name is Michael. Okay. And she showed me images, and I'm like, okay, well, that's the guy I call Spartan. Okay. His name is Michael. That alter's name is Michael. And apparently, you know, she, because I woke up to this, she had no intention of revealing any of this to me, but she's like something along the lines of passing the time, just answering my questions with whatever it is she's doing. As far as I'm concerned, she's just standing there, but I know she's doing something. Um, so the way she showed it to me in my head was they create altars 
differently than what the humans do. They have no need to um, produce trauma to form an altar. They, they're so psychically powerful. They can literally just form a wall in your mind off into the side and form and program a consciousness there. And that's okay. it. You have, you, you've been programmed an altar into that person. She said that's what she did and that's why she calls me her child. Um, cause she had a hand in designing the program that is Michael. Uh, the way she explained it to me is you can't completely, not even the Draco, you can't completely program every single detail facet of an altar. No, um, there are aspects of the subconscious soul level of the being that is being used that exist in every single altar there it's it's almost like base programming of that mm -hmm. person yeah i've noticed and mine that, that that i have reintegrated the same our... aspects yeah they have that what, what they can do is they figure out what those aspects are and then they can work around that and they're able to form everything else um so there's that so they do that um so who it was that that grew up um with the draco was my alter michael okay and uh so that was an interesting revelation um i remember having dreams, nightmares was a little kid of being taken uh, um, just in this room. There's this room and it's almost, it's so dark in the room that you can barely, you can't even see the other wall. You can see the other kids in the room. There's a bunch of kids. I always called it the waiting room because we were all just left in there for a little while and they'd come and take us one at a time. Okay. But it was it was a reptilian that came and took us one at a time. There was a human woman in there that that would come with the Draco and then there was a Draco that would that would that I don't remember the other kids being taken. I might have been the first one taken cuz all I remember is Cat. I used to call her the blonde-haired girl cuz before we met here. Mm -hmm. Um I call her Cat. Her name isn't Cat here, but that's what I called her. So that's what I call her. Um, Is she public? No, no. Okay. She's not public. That that's why I use the name Cat. Okay. Because um, she's part of my story, and I needed to give her a name. Um, so I remember that we met like that early we were both in that room now what's interesting is in that room we're both exactly the same age here she's 15 12 12 or 15 years older than me so somewhere around there yeah that's that's one of the things that i've been hearing from the folks your age is mid 30s is that they have interacted with people both young, younger and older. It's like where they're being processed is almost timeless. Me, Kat, and Will got together and kind of figured out because we remember. Well, Will is together. public, so you can use yeah. you can use his name. Will Glover. Um, he, we, we got together and figured out that. It was one of three things. It was either um, I was being brought forward in time to their time because they're both older than me or they were being brought back in my time or all three of us along with all the other kids were being taken and put into a central point in time where they were for whatever reason uh, most useful or where that program needed kids or whatever 
uh, we think that that's actually was actually the case. And then when we're brought back, we're put back in our original time. Uh, so the fact that they're still doing this means that they're doing it in a way that is not creating an alternate timeline because yeah. that's what the, the uh, guardians are really against when it comes to time manipulation, time travel. They don't care if you time travel as long as you do not create an alternate timeline because that fucks up everybody else. Yeah, it, it uses a lot of energy too that, that draws from everyone else. Um, that's one of the things that I've encountered with a lot of people in the community is they think that every time they pick their nose, it creates a new timeline and that's not the case. So um, that, that's an important distinction to make. Um, my time at Montauk, uh, they were investigating the butterfly effect, which is another form of this, what happens with a timeline. And uh, they found that there were key individuals who were important whether it be a butterfly 10 million years ago or, or a human today, there are key individuals who make a difference in, in timelines and that you pretty much have to leave those individuals alone, but that everybody else are kind of like filler. That yes, they're real. Yes, they have souls. Yes, they have individual lives that, that, matter to them and the people they know, but that as far as affecting the timeline that they don't have an influence. Kind of makes sense to me. Those of us who have time traveled in these programs, we look at that and go, hmm, that makes sense. And then there's the corollary of Hmm, I must have not mattered. <laughs> and I think that's the reason that everybody wants to think that every time they pick their nose that they've created a timeline is because... They want to feel important and significant. Yes. Um, I'm weird because when I realized I must not be important, it was like, whew, that pressure's <laughs> off. <laughs> Little did you know. What? Now that I'm just cracking a joke. Little oh, did okay. you know. Um, yeah. I, the only memories I have of dealing with um, time is as a little kid. Um, this was with the CIA um, or whatever group this was. This was on Earth. I know that. You know how you get you can you can just know if you're not on Earth and if you are on Earth in your past memories. Yeah, so there's cool. a, a, a. It's like a vibe. Yeah, there's for lack of a better term, it's like there's a feel to Earth. Yeah, I was on Earth. Um, there were all these people in lab coats. Um, there was this place, the tile on the walls and floors and all looked yellow and old. Like mm. maybe at one point in time it was white, <laughs> but it all looked yellow and old. Um, stained wood, old stained wood um, um, baseboards around the doors as if this place was old. Um, the rooms were pretty much void of everything. There was actually a bed there. I, I remember being kept in a cage once, um, an electrified cage. Like it was like, it, it seemed like a dog cage. This place- uh, that, was actually I remember the, the cages from Montauk. Yeah. I remember them being, I remember those cages being stacked up and there was a kid in every one. Yeah. And they were just shoved into, into a room. It was almost like a warehouse room. And, and 
it, they were just stacked up. It it made you felt like they they just shoved you there and forgot about you. They probably did. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway, back to. Okay, that so. I don't know if it, it was a talk. I don't know if it was. It could have been. Um. In that in that place, there was like this. It it felt almost like a pool room. Everything was tile. There was this this pool that was. It almost had like a glow to it. Um, and there was a device in it um, where you laid. It was like five or six or seven kids, little kids. With, there was the pod for each one, and then they get it, and then you would submerge you into the. The water where only your your face was uh showing out and uh i remember the device linked us together somehow and the power of our minds would see into the future and the past and all of that uh that's how project looking glass works it when i started remembering that it reminded me of that um that movie with what's his name the same guy that did the mission impossible acted in the mission impossible movies no oh, okay um names are escaping um, me today tom cruise yeah yeah that movie um where he's like in the future his characters in the future is like a time detective or almost like not a time detective but they have the ability to um to view events before they happen crimes before they happen because um, of these kids that are kept in the yeah. water department and of pre-crime yeah that reminded me of that movie when i started remembering that i'm like they're showing it right in front of our faces yeah they are um my understanding of the the secret groups is that they believe that if they put it out there to the public and you don't say no that when they do it to you that they have no karma from it basically they have your consent that's kind of yeah that's kind of how the galactic authority sees it and that's why they do it that way yeah, that's exactly how the, the Galactic Authority sees it. So um, I can understand why they're doing it. And every time that I mention that in one of these interviews, I get all kinds of feedback about people who think I'm basically full of shit. <laughs> but you and I both know this is exactly how the Galactic Authority operates, that if you don't say no you have said yes and so if you want there is no on the fence for them no if you don't say no and stand to your no then you've automatically said yes there is no fence there's no fence there's no there's no doubts there's no no waffling on it if you did not say no then you said yes and um Yet every religion on earth is submit, 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 don't say no. Yeah, there's a reason why that that's that way. The, yeah. the beings, the different beings that created each of those religions, they want you to not say no. They want you to submit. Yeah. They want you to submit so that they can continue to torture you forever. However, <clears throat> All of these people who believe those religions will say nasty things about this when it's uploaded to my YouTube. <laughs> well, that's their problem. Shouldn't listen to them. All you can do is present what what you know, and whoever accepts it will accept it. Whoever doesn't can move on. Uh, so, um, you were in this room, and 
the waiting room with Kat. And how did that go? I remember huddling up against the wall, like Kat and I were holding each other. That was the first, I think that was the first time we had met. Um, but we were huddled up against the wall, holding each other. There were, all the kids were huddled up against the wall. Some of them were in like large huddles, but they were all up against the wall, holding each other. Um, How old remember, were you about? Oh God, somewhere between three and five. Maybe not as young as three. Um, maybe between four and six, somewhere in there. Okay. Um, I remember the woman, I don't remember a steady stream of, of, of memory. I just remember suddenly we're standing in the middle of the room, just me and Kat and this woman. The woman is standing behind Kat, holding her at the shoulders, like so. And I'm holding on to Kat's hand. Kat's holding on to my hand. And this, I have this other hand had come and grabbed me right here on this shoulder. But what was weird was the look of the hand um it might have actually been a mantid because it just kind of it was three fingers okay. and it just kind of seemed like the bone was on the outside it's like it was just hard it could have been it could have been a scaly hand like you know a reptilian it could have been a uh, mantid i can't I couldn't see that well, and I was too in shock to really pay attention to that little tidbit. I just remember that hand coming, grabbing, dragging me away, and that was that memory. Um, and I don't think the altar Michael had been created yet in that by the at that time. So, so this was you. This was me. That may have been why that was the first memory I had ever dreamt about when I was a kid. I remember dreaming about that room over and over as a kid. And I, I had threw it in the back of my mind. I had forgotten about it, thought it was just nothing until years later when I started remembering more and more and more. And then I came back to my old dreams and I'm like, Oh, crap, that was a memory. Yeah, um, since you brought up dreams and memories, that's one of the issues that we have in our community is people not being able to tell the difference. If you have sensory input, like smells, tastes, feels, um, physical feels rather than than emotional feels that puts it more in the category of memory yeah if you are suddenly flying or it's related to something you saw on tv then it's definitely a dream right or you suddenly can't move very fast you go to punch somebody in your hands moving like at this speed that's a dream yeah so um the more realistic it is the more likely it was a memory yeah and the more emotional content to it um if you're having sensory input with it and emotional content then those memories are called flashbacks and anyone who has interacted with a war veteran knows what flashbacks are about and I have several friends who are uh, 
were in various uh, conflicts with the Marines. Yeah. They all came back with PTSD. Well, a lot of us have PS PTSD and our doctors can't figure out why. <laughs> One of my Marine Corps friends uh, had to have you send it uh, the link elsewhere, and now I'm having connection issues. And I know it's on my end. So. Okay, where was I? What did you hear? I don't know. I blanked. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, crap. Okay, so um, you had you had been grabbed and pulled away from Cat at the the waiting room, right? And um, was that that was obviously not the last time you saw her? So well, nope. we uh, we pretty much were raised together. Um, I remember raised in a home uh, by a um, draconian, by a reptilian, um, and it wasn't until I think it was a year, year and a half ago maybe, that I finally remembered his name, and his name is Jir Akan. Yeah, I remember whenever we were first talking, I, I... I said something about that the and, warrior uh, warrior Draco were a different race, and you jumped my ass. <laughs> I did, I did, and uh, they are a different race. And we we agree with that. The thing is, is at the time I thought he said that was his species name, Jirakan, or something along those lines. I, I didn't and I know. Was corrected this. later. I was corrected by him later. Oh, that's my name, and Akan is the house. Yeah, well, what had happened was I was just, you, you jumped me about calling them Draco, and then you jumped me about oh, yeah, they that they were Jurican. And then when I said that in an interview, because you were so insistent about it, then I you said, oh, no, that was his it. name. And I'm like, I apologize. I'm I have not apologized going. about it. I'm like, oh, no. So, <laughs> yeah. Like I screwed up. Uh, but anyway, um, but yeah, they really do hate being called Draco. And yet they're, they are Excellent. out of the seven races that make up the Dr Draco Empire, they are number two. Yeah. Um, I, th I think it's really all of them. It's like if you're going to call them by, by what they are, call them Draconian. They, they hate being called Draco. It's like derogatory to them. Well, my understanding was that they were just pissed that they had been conquered. That is definitely the case. I remember talking to you about that now. Um, that was millions of years ago. Yeah, it was. They, they've still been pissed an about it. They've been right. an empire for millions of years, and they are the race that is number two in charge. They and were the first race to be conquered by the Draconians. Yeah, they're the closest. Draconians. They're, they're the closest homeworld to yeah. the Alpha Drax. And... Uh, they don't like being called Draconians or Draco. The Draconians themselves don't like being called Draco. They think it's der it, it's derogatory. Um, well, if I have how, their what name, I, what I've gotten from them. if I have their name, I call them by their name. If yeah. I'm on Earth, I call them by what people understand because right. what I say about them is so different than the normal understanding of them that I get the deer in the headlights anyway. My telepathic connection is so weak that I've asked and didn't hear anything if they said anything. Um, 
it took a long time to get um, Jer's name. And I had originally thought that was, he was giving me their species name. Well, so you and Kat were at Jer Akan's house. Yes, um, we were raised by him. He was, he's a high ranking um, um, general in their army. Um, before that, or I, I don't even know when this memory occurred. I just remember being brought before the queen um, by Jur. And I'm, I, I come into this giant hall room type thing where this this throne on the other end and it's almost like being in a solid metal cathedral <laughs> no joke everything's shiny um and the wall it's a long hall and the wall is lined with female draco draconians um all armored out and there's this one dragonian. black armor no silver armor okay i've seen the ones in the black armor i don't know what the color codes um refer to or even if that's a rank or something or or just um job duty i don't know i just know that these were lined across the hall with silver armor and the one there was one at her side wearing gold armor okay at the queen's side wearing gold armor and um i know people give me flack for for this part of the memory i remember her leaning in um to the queen um whether she was saying something psychically or what and if that was the case, you don't have to lean in. But I remember her leaning in. Um, and I've actually had friends give me flack, but well, they're psychic. Why would she need to lean in? I don't know. That's just all I, that's how I remember it. Um, but anyway, moving on. So he presents me before the draconian queen. And at first she's all whatever, you know, nonchalant. And I know they're talking. I am not privy to anything being said. I don't hear anything, but I know they're talking to each other. Um, and then suddenly this view screen just kind of appears in front of the queen. Um, could have been like uh, virtual, um, you know, like holographic. And it has some stuff off the one side, but then the main part of it was like this circle with stuff coming off of it kind of like frequency um kind of stuff just all around it and she's looking at this thing and all of a sudden her jaw drops and her face is like the face of shock and awe and she just looks right at me and that's all i remember of that and i i have no idea why Okay. You know, another friend who was remote viewing that um, claims that she were, she was looking in that and and noticed that I in a past life was one of her royal ancestors. Oh. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I don't remember any of that. I just, what I do know is she looked at that thing and she's in awe at something and, and shocked about something regarding me. I don't know what. Okay. Um, my next memories are on a planet. It was like a farm. His house was like a farm. They grew oats. They grew oats there. Um, 
And I remember Kat being there. It was me, Kat, and Jer's um, son. And he, he, he basically cared for us as if his, we were his kids. Um, and I remember the three of us were in the oat field playing. <laughs> did yeah. he get upset about you knocking over the grass? I don't think we did. Um, I just, I, I don't remember any, the one memory I have of us playing in the, uh, in the field of oats, I, we were playing kind of like a hide and seek type of thing mm -hmm. or, uh, or, um, you know, you're it, you know, chase type of thing. I know we were doing that kind of play. Um, I remember being called up to this, this hill and Jer just kind of plops down onto the ground and the three of us were just sitting there in front of him. We were all cross-legged and I know he was in the, he was teaching us like meditation or something. Like he was giving us a lesson in the meditation. Um, later on, I remember the training, the combat training. Um, and it was like everybody in the house of a con, um, that was up and coming, you know, learning to learning combat training went to this one place. And it was all, it was like stone. The whole place was like stone. And there was this one area where all the stone was just broken up, you know. Um, and I remember, I remember some of the other kids and we're talking about, it was me, Kat, and maybe one or two other humans. The rest of them were full-blooded Draco, Draconians. Um, they were all taller than us, even as kids. Even if we were well, the same age, they were taller than us. Of course they were. They end up two to three times taller than us when they're full grown, so of course they'd be bigger. Um, Jer's about 12 foot tall. Yeah. Nice, nice. Um, so I remember It's all vague. I remember them, him trying to teach us the uh, the combat system that the House of Akan is known for. And I presume this is some of the, a lot of the foundation and basics are whole planet wide or, or basically whole species wide. You know, this is what their people teach is combat. Um, okay. And it's it it almost goes down to magic and energy manipulation as its foundation before it even gets into the uh, hand to hand combat. Um, you learn to control your mind first. I don't remember how to do any of it, um, but I remember. Remember him trying to teach all of us to basically take control of the subconscious will or the subconscious belief system. When you can control the, the subconscious's belief system on a conscious level by, you know, by conscious will, Basically, there's almost nothing you can't do because it's the subconscious that creates the walls and blocks that limit your reality on yeah. a physical, tangible level. If, if your subconscious believed 100% wholeheartedly that a mere push of my finger would break through that wall, that's exactly what would happen. If my subconscious believed completely wholeheartedly that me jumping off this 
10 story building and landing perfectly fine uh, on the ground with not a scratch that that's what would happen. Um, that's the and it, same it's basically basics. like a natural form of magic. It's that's controlling. basically what we were taught at Langley as part of the underlying psionics training. I remember learning that there too, not at Langley. It was when I was taken into the SSP, the humans uh, programs. Yeah. Um, I remember having to relearn everything because that was a different altar. Yeah. That was an altar. Michael was an altar controlled by the draconians, by the empire. And the humans did not have access to that altar. So, so I had, so the other altars had to learn everything else again. The so other altars had to learn created, the human system. Had to learn. The, the other altars had to learn the human system, which yeah. um, is called psionics. And um, I recently did a CIA site search and could not find find it there at all so apparently psionics is still classified <laughs> well had to look um, yeah yeah i've looked for some stuff yeah. and wondered well uh, science actually starting to be trickled down it's like almost on a daily basis now Oh, such and such university uh, came up with this. No, they were handed that and asked to present it. Exactly. They were handed that and asked to present it. And there have been lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of, of patents that have come out in the last year to year and a half, mostly related to things that I had released in you know i had talked about in 2016 2017 and um it's been um it's been interesting to see what i talked about coming forward two three years later <laughs> yeah. but but no i'm not affecting the timeline at all Well, we know how that goes, right? Right. So, um, where were we? You were talking about, you were supposed to be talking about the training that you got at Jura Khan's house with Kat. Yeah. As far as training goes, um, it was that one lesson is really all I remember. I don't remember the details of the lesson. I just remember that and I remember not being able to get it. Um, everybody else got it. Even with Jur kind of showing me mentally, you know, his memories of, of doing it, I was still having trouble mm -hmm. basically. It's like knowing what to do and doing it are two different things. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So. I was having a lot of trouble with that. I got, and I'm extremely stubborn and pig headed and can get pissy when you something think? doesn't go right uh, the way I want it. So, yes, and, people, Matt and I actually know each other. <laughs> and so, I, and Michael, that altar is exact. That's probably one of the subconscious, um, you know soul things that is just part of my being because <laughs> Michael's the exact same way. Um, so I remember getting pissy, storming off and going sit on this rock out in the middle of nowhere. I was <laughs> practically in view of a window at Jer's house. So but you're, out, you're out there that, pouting not pouting i was i was sitting on there meditating and i got so pissed and stubborn 
I literally said, I'm not moving from this stop, this spot until I get it right. I'm, I basically told myself, I'm either going to get it right or I'm going to die right here on sitting here. And I sat there meditating forever. I don't know how long I met. It could have been a couple of days or more. I don't know. I just remember sitting there and not moving until I made it work. Till I reached that state of mind that everybody else had already reached a lot easier than me. Well, I get, I just remember walking back into the, uh, the, uh, the area where we were learning the school and everybody else was just kind of, they were getting it. And, you know, they were like making, um, they were like breaking um, stones and stuff like that. That's basically it. You know, it's like you're breaking stones with psychic force um, mm -hmm. for your being. And it's your subconscious that really controls that. Yeah. Your connection to that psychic force that's always surrounding you in space. And the whole lesson was about eliminating the blocks that have been created in your mind, in your subconscious, and learning to control that. And I remember walking over to the wall, and I remember, I remember putting my fist like I made a solid fist. Um, well, it looked like a solid fist. I don't remember, really remember the feeling, but it, I think it was more like a, just a very loose, it just made a fist. And I, I basically put it up against the wall. And after a moment, everybody else is watching, making fun and laughing. And suddenly the entire wall about maybe 10 feet to either side and these and this wall was like three four feet thick and yeah. it was it was at least as tall as jur was and the that whole area of the wall just crumbled outwards like a force had just hit it and everybody shut up because you finally did it i finally get it here on earth my mom used to say when i was a kid used to tell people um that matt all matt always tends to start the race last and yet somehow he always finishes first <laughs> it's just my personality i have this way of seeing things that i don't understand the way other everyone else understands the things that are naturally intuitive to the to the average person if you teach it to me the way they understand it i won't get it but after a while i will eventually get it my way and once i do the way i've gone around understanding it allows me to take it further than they thought was possible uh, um, as I've remembered the psionics, um, I, I've been able to use parts of it here on Earth. Um, my major abilities are behind a firewall, but some of the parts of it I've been able to access and use. And it's, it's the same idea of you have these blocks that are because of how you're raised like you believe solid solid objects are solid and really they're not and you have to i have memories of putting my hand through solid objects of moving through solid objects simply on the subconscious belief that because they're not really solid you know, just the space between atoms that you can move through without interacting.
but you really, really have to believe it at your core or else you find yourself starting through and getting stuck. <laughs> yeah. You definitely don't want to get stuck when you're doing that. No. <laughs> I've come to the realization that all of the advanced science and technology that the programs have is normals trying to copy what advanced beings are capable of doing psionically, naturally, without technology. Yeah. And because we were augmented with um, draconian DNA, we have an easier time um, with that than a normal. And when I say normal, I'm referring to people who have not been augmented. They're just normal human beings. Yeah, um, the public probably should know that that's our standard nomenclature, that it's not meant to be an insult. It's simple, simple science that terminology. You, you somehow. Um, we're we're it, different. We are the experimentals and you are the controls, but yep. calling, calling them normal. We're the lab rats. We're the lab yeah. rats. We are the lab rats, you're the normal people that have not been messed with. So it's not We're meant the lab to be... rats that survived. Yeah, that's the truth of the matter, the lab rats that survived. So um, folks who think that we're insulting them, no. Um, some of us use the term normie, and I think that's rather insulting. But that seems very insulting. I use the term normal just as an identifier. It's, yeah. a, it's a simple linguistic identifier. So we, the lab rats who survived, are capable of things that normals are not. And it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with them, just that we were messed with and they weren't. We, we've come to discover that the genetics if, if humans were evolved, if humans were to evolve naturally without people messing with them, without other races coming in and messing with them any further, they would eventually obtain these genetics on their own and not through Darwinian natural selection. It's basically an energy body thing that it's the energy body that controls the DNA. DNA is only an antenna. When you're being reaches that point, it will alter the DNA. Yes. What and I've seen looking through history is that those of us who have achieved this level, either through genetic manipulation like we did or through other means, have historically been called witches or Yep. Or I definitely have that in my bloodline. Well, there are certain religious groups that have gone through and tried to genocide that out because for some reason they didn't want it to happen. So uh, people should be aware that this could have been a lot more standard in the population than it is that it has been artificially removed what what i think people should really understand is all these genocides that have happened in history especially by the catholic church the reasons for them are a lie mm -hmm. um, the public reasons for them are a lie they were trying to kill off the descendants of Jesus, because the descendants of Jesus had all of these abilities, all the abilities that Jesus had, his direct children had. Mm -hmm. And then as time went by, of course, it got watered down to where we are now. Basically, today's um, um, witches and, and, and people of that like 
people who are naturally able to feel their body's energy or see spirits walking across the room without, <laughs> ever, without ever or hear voices in the house where they were com they're completely alone. These people or, have or to different see. genetics than normal people who never think they're just crazy. They never saw any of that. Yeah, um, there's there's the genetic variation family. between people is as irrespective of their racial group because there are people in other countries, other races that are still able to do a lot of the same things. Um, any country that has a lot of magic or witchcraft or hoodoo or voodoo or any of those founded in that individual's genetics yes and they're a they, different species in in a, in essence we're a different species it's, well, it's basically the concept of the mutants and the uh, inhumans and yeah the x-men basically we're a different species And yet we can interbreed with them. Because we're still mostly human. So um, I've been trying to ad address the, like the fear porn about it. Um, that we've been living together all these years and it's actually the mutants who have been targeted, not the normals. Right. Think about this. If the if if let's just call us mutants. If the mutants were so dangerous, don't you think the normals would not exist anymore? Pretty much. It's the normals' fear of the mutants that is the problem. And the and f from my understanding, fear can only exist in ignorance. I don't know about that one. There have been people that the more I knew them, the more I disliked them. <laughs> that's, a, that's a dislike, not a fear. Okay. Fear. I'm talking about fear of something. Um, Every time I've ever had been afraid of something, I found out it was because I really didn't know it and understand it. Once I gained an understanding of a thing, I stopped being afraid of it. Yeah. Whether I conquered it or befriended it, I simply stopped being afraid. That helps. So what did Jurakan say whenever that you knocked down his wall? I don't remember. That's pretty much it from that with that memory. Um now, I remember from our podcast we did last year that uh, you and Kat and I believe Will were involved with some sort of a ship. That is later on recently that we basically remote viewed ourselves out there. Um, the, the altars that, you know, the Draco altars. That are that are out there, and um, basically on the run. And why are you on that, the run? I th I, I think that with, would make a good story. I don't know with hundred percent certainty that this memory correlates. All I remember is, for some reason. I was part of something. I walked into a draconian's uh, throne room, and this wasn't a. Well, he was white, so okay, he could have been. He was a royal. He was white. Um, I killed him. Why? He, I don't know. I don't know. I you mean, just walked I, into his place and killed him. Not exactly. I, was, I went there to kill him, but I didn't just walk up and kill him. I let him defend himself first. He, he made the first strike. Okay. 
Um, he punt. He threw a punch, and my telekinesis kicked in, and my telekinesis kind of wraps my body, and when I throw a punch, it projects with it and makes things explode. And okay. his whole arm exploded when I my hand when my fist made contact with his. And then I come around with the other fist and hit his knee, opposite side of his body. And his knee exploded and he falls down and I come back with the other fist with an uppercut and right at his chin, his whole head exploded. Um, I don't know if they regenerated him or what. I just know that I was in severe trouble. Yeah, I was put in as my punishment. I was sent to the war games to die. I was sent to the arena, the fighting pit to die. Um, I remember fighting all kinds of different um, people. Uh, there was this one uh, Jirakin that was there too. He was apparently a uh, a dishonored um, high-ranking military person. I don't know if he was a general or not, uh, but he's on the ship now too with me. Um, we were put up against each other and after a while of fighting, we I finally um, won. He's on the ground and er, um, the whole crowd is cheering for me to cut his head off. And I dropped my sword and reached out my hand and um it was something i can't remember what i said um uh, it wasn't in english i know that much <laughs> it was something to the effect of um Nope, nope. I can't remember. Basically, he joined my crew. Okay. I spared his life. He joined my crew. Uh, another situation happened with uh, three female reptilians. There was more than them in the arena. Those were the three that survived. I remember um, being blinded losing an arm and both of my feet being shattered and yet I was still standing. Um, I know I was using my telekinesis to stay standing. <laughs> um, okay. I know I was using my remote viewing to see everything around me because I lost my sight. Um, and I was holding a sword bigger than my hand um, with only one arm and one arm missing. And I, I, I managed to kill three or four of them. And I, I basically, I was about done for the count and I still managed to gain the strength to stand back up. The three that survived were in so awe of, of that. They dropped their weapons and knelt in front of me and lowered their heads. Cool. What well, what species were they? I know they were they were reptilian. They were not white royals. Um, neither was the I know the general was part of your species. Uh, they I don't know which species they were. They may okay. have been um, I don't know. One of them had kind of like yellow um, stripes. Um, she was cool looking. Um, but they're they're also on the ship. I know I kept winning, or I should say I kept surviving. I mean, well, that's kind of the same thing by the skin of my teeth. They had to throw me in the region tank a lot. 
because I just refused to give up. Or I should say Michael refused to give up. If if Matthew now was put in that situation, I would die. But my Michael was trained and had all the abilities and psionics and and everything needed to survive that situation. Um, and like just having these memories are intense. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I don't have near the recall as far as incidences that you do, but whenever that I I get the flashes of battle they're like majorly intense and, I remember uh, yeah I remember the next thing I remember wasn't actually a memory it was me and Will were on the phone together and it's weird that every time Will and I are on the phone together something weird happens it's Will like, has Will has that effect. Um, he's got this ability of just drawing you in and taking you for a ride. Uh, <laughs> he he has the most intense telepathic ability of anyone I've encountered on Earth. Yeah, and he is able to connect with you and take you with him into the altar experiencing the memory. Oh, we, so we've done that a couple times. Um, constantly at will. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, that that is will is just it, it's like incredible and I've not seen anyone else able to do that. And um, you know, if, if he was on the phone with you and you were doing this, this is a story I want to hear. Yeah, so, and my mom is sitting in the rocking chair next to me. I'm sitting on the sofa. And I'm like, I'm freaking out. I'm like going blind here. And I'm like, well, what's going on? And I'm like out of it all of a sudden. And then suddenly my alter Michael is seeing through my eyes and I'm seeing through his eyes. Okay. We're not in control of each other's bodies. It's weird. But we're suddenly aware of each other and seeing each other's environments. Okay. So Michael um, gets to see your mom. Basically. So, and what I got from him was interesting. That was it. <laughs> that was it. I'm like, interesting. What? That's it? That's all you have? <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, I, he, I've he, heard he, stuff like that out of your mouth. I mean, he was in not... a stasis tank. And nothing but underwear. Um, okay. It was an all glass stasis tank. It, the, it was like octagon um, glass two uh, when they put me in stasis there's not even underwear i don't know uh, i don't know how he how, how did he read underwear. underwear there was clear underwear <laughs> uh, i don't know i don't know um anyway there was this it was almost like a ping had occurred and we found out later on that cat's altar was there rescuing him and was waking him up with this ping and somehow this ping piggybacked on our subconscious soul level connection and linked us for a few minutes okay and will being a really powerful antenna made that connection possible yeah so all of that was occurring at the same time so um it's it's almost like michael wakes up and while still in the tube we're getting this we're seeing through each other's eyes thing and then suddenly after after he's all like aware of what's going on now 
the whole thing explodes away from him in every direction. He's just floating there in, in blue light. You've heard me talk about that. It's my telekinesis. You know, kind of like um, Scarlet Witch with the red energy. Um, that's kind of how it looks, but blue. Okay. Um, I've talked about it for years. Um, you haven't mentioned it to me, but that's okay. I'm not the only... I'm not the only one who's yeah. interviewed you, am I? Okay, I, yeah, no, uh, other people interviewed me. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, I don't, I don't own any of the people I interview. They're free agents. Can, you know, they're welcome to come and go and talk to me if they want, or talk to anybody else they want. <laughs> um, well, just bunny trailing for a second. There was a training or testing um, thing going on, and there was a uh, a reptilian in front of me. There was a big, giant room that was like the size of a football court or something, and it was completely enclosed room. And behind me, above, was this glassed out, completely enclosed um, um, viewing room, and it was like a luxury viewing room. Um, and there were humans in there. Um, and then there was this, this reptilian, this big, big 12 foot tall reptilian in front of me on the other side of the room. And all of a sudden he starts charging me. Well, this isn't the first time I have memories of, of this, but this is, I remember being in that room as a kid with cat. And I remember <laughs> us, the training was to avoid and evade attacks from extremely large and powerful opponent you know, to learn how to survive and i remember having broken legs and ribs and during during all that um but this time was different it i was angry i, I could feel my anger okay something had been taken from me i don't know what it was I just remember I'm sick of doing things your way and I wasn't going to evade this time and suddenly my arm my left arm starts to glow this blue it's like this blue electric energy just, just starts to cover it all the way to the shoulder and I just he comes at me with a swing and I just swung and his whole arm exploded he's screaming everybody in the room's jaw drops they're all like what the hell yeah for that to come they from a human that. they're not they weren't expect they were expecting people trained to survive they weren't expecting people to be capable of taking on stronger et opponents at their level yeah they were just expecting to train people to survive and they start getting these metas um dna explain augmented what people. a meta is it's somebody with dna augmented um it's a dna augmented person who has stronger psionic abilities um and the way your psionic abilities are first initiated is through trauma Mm -hmm. I figured it out. Uh, basically, the type of trauma uh, combined with your personality and how your subconscious wants to deal with that trauma is how your first ability will manifest, is what will define what manifests. You, you're not stuck with just that. Yeah. You can learn and grow and develop other things that's the open door that that first manifests and mine was telekinesis mine that, mine was going interdimensional and basically removing myself from the situation actually yours was a psychic shield that could physically shield off people <laughs> that was the psychic ability that that 
manifested when those raptors attacked you on Mars. Okay. That's what I'm referring to. Well, before that, when I was at, at Montauk, I was, I was going, I was going hyper, I was going hyperdimensional to run away. Yeah, but that was with the aid of the chair. Okay. That wasn't you all by yourself. That was with the aid of the chair. You were in the chair, controlling it, taking you somewhere else. Yeah. That shield. But I took the chair you. with me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Your first manifestation was that shield, that psionic shield that protected yeah. you and those those other kids from the from the uh that the mars whatever, raptors yeah mars raptors that's what i'm referring to as extreme trauma the subconscious when you have the certain genetics that allows for a stronger connection to the psionic etheric energy that surrounds and passes through everything Certain yeah. genetics act as stronger antennas that are stronger focus that can control that energy. And when the subconscious, um, it reacts to extreme fight or flight, need to survive, I'm about to die. People with those genetics are going to manifest their ability. And the first ability manifests de defining what your subconscious through your personality traits feels it needs to survive that moment. Yeah, well, and I created a force, you. basically a force field and, and kept those of us inside it safe for the duration. And mine was feeling of being weak. I needed to be stronger than the other guy. I needed to hold my ground and and this telekinesis manifested. Um, Kat, hers manifested as a telepathic ability so strong she could actually push Draco's out of her mind. That's impressive. Very uh, Will's ability manifested, the first ability manifested as basically a psychic vampire, but, um, he's not a vampire, he was a, he was a reptilian who was psychically vampirizing, sucking his energy, and out of a need to survive, he copied that ability and made the, the Draco stop. So it's like they know, they it's like they can they can tell your personality and know what events are going to create what initial ability. It's like they've got it to an exact science. Hmm. As far as on the on the uh, Draco Empire, um, as far as they're concerned, they've got it down to an exact science. They know exactly what is going to manifest on, um, for your personality under what conditions. Um, so back to getting away from the bunny trail, back to um, where was I? You were with, with on, oh. the, on the phone with, with Will. On the phone with Will. So that's how my telekinesis manifested and, and that was the first ability I had. Um, I also um, learned down the road, you know, how to teleport um, in combat short distances. It takes a lot of mental focus to teleport. Yeah, it does. Um, so to be able to do it under combat duress is a feat in and of itself. So to be able to do it short distances around an opponent or a group of opponents um, is very good. If you're teleporting, the distance is kind of irrelevant. Well, no, what it is is 
that level of control, being able to focus on teleporting to a new location while under combat duress. Mm-hmm. Literally in the middle of close quarters combat. Yeah. That's multitasking on a level that I right now am not capable of. I am no longer capable of multitasking. Um, I am at the point where I can do one and a half things <laughs> at a time. It's and usually what it is I'm doing. It usually I will screw up the second thing. If, so, it, if it comes to cooking, I can multitask with the best of them. It all depends on what I'm doing. Driving, no, can't multitask. I'm either talking or I'm driving. Can't do both. <laughs> My family <laughs> understands that. <laughs> well, both. I can still talk while I drive, but um, since I had my shoulder shredded the last time, um, I haven't done much driving because it will just go out on me and I can't, you know, it's my dominant arm. So it makes driving difficult. At least I don't have a, a stick shift. Um, <laughs> yeah, all I've ever owned was a stick shift. Um, that was pretty much all I had ever owned until I got with Lou and he has everything we've had since has been on automatic. I like standards, you know, it's just, it's just what I'm used to. I like a four in the floor, but I've done a column shift. Hey, you know, the best thing in the world is to get in some little hot rod sports car with a car with a floor in the floor and then get into the zone and you're one with the machine and it's almost as good as being in a fighter plane. That's probably why I've never owned one sports car or anything fast. <laughs> Cuz if I I I always tell myself if I ha- if I get into one of those I'm going to hurt myself. No, 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 no. You don't hurt yourself. Although um, I had one of those little Datsuns. Um, not the fancy one, but the one that it all, it almost looked like a Toyota Corolla. And, you know, I'm using the word Datsun rather than Nissan. So that tells you how long ago this was. Yeah, and, and I've got my three kids in the car with me, and it's just me and the three kids. And, and so it's two in the back and one in the front seat, and we're going. I live north of Yosemite, so we're going down the 99, and we're heading towards Fresno. They had a doctor's appointment, and there was this pileup, and there's a truck stopped in front of me suddenly, and behind me, there's this monster pickup pull it, pulling one of those um, big, huge camper trailers, the kind you can live in. And he's not, like, not, and he, 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 yeah, and he, and he's, he's like not stopping. And I'm seeing this coming and I, I tilt, you know, you can do the tilt the the car where that you know you're going to be hit you know there's nothing you can do to stop being hit but you can tilt it where instead of becoming a Dotson sandwich you're going off the road right <laughs> you know so i did that and um what really just shocked the hell out of me was after this accident I took the toilet plunger and pulled the trunk back out. (laughs) It was, it was that bad in the metal. Toilet plunger? Just a minute. Well, welcome back after the knock on my door. So we were discussing your training and then you being on a ship with with all these reptilians and cat and will and 
what else what are you guys doing um mostly staying off the radar running <laughs> i don't know exactly from who or what for what reason i just have the images that i see so how did you get a ship we stole it how did you get by with that i don't know there was this planet and there was this ship it looks almost it looks ancient um it looks like a combination of modern tech and mayan stone technology it's weird um it's like a combination of the two it's a big cigar shaped um not like anything we've had in our skies um it it definitely has like a clay reddish brown clay like color to parts of it um it's not one solid color um it's it's not entirely smooth there's this one section in the center that's um kind of different it's hard to explain because i don't really see all of it in my memory okay um i know we stole it from somebody not a military person not the regular military no this yeah this i was i i've always questioned was, because when i was out there i have always had a chip in my head that if i rebelled in any way they would blow up my head and so i hear all these stories about people are out there rogue and i'm like how the thing is is michael isn't Nachtwaffen or SSP. Okay. Michael is Draconian Empire. So That's basically it. what Yakarta Hendrix does. Yes. That they don't chip people. Or at least okay. they don't put explosive chips in people's heads. They they treat you like you're a part of their society. They treat you as one of their own. They don't treat you as a slave. Okay. Um, at least when you are from Earth levels. and you are in Noxwaffen, you are chipped. And this is this this is the biggest problem that I have with some of the stories currently being told, is that. When you are from Earth and you are in Nachtwaffen, you are chipped. And if you even think about Earth, if you think about doing anything that's against orders, if you think about doing anything selfish, if you even consider thinking that life isn't fair, First thing, you will find yourself on the floor writhing in pain. The second thing is you'll be given a seizure. The third thing is they'll blow up your head. In my and you'll wake, experience, you'll wake up in regen. <laughs> in, in my Nachtwaffen experience, I don't remember even thinking of Earth at all or considering it earth in any way i think my altars might not even know earth exists that that's most of mine don't i remember hearing passengers who were slaves say i'm from earth take me home and i hear myself saying the earth is taught earth is dead right you know, that's, that's what I tell them. And, you know, the Erde is taught. That's what my level there really believes. Unless you're on a ship that comes to Earth like Tony was, you don't know Earth has anybody left. I don't know if... I would assume 
of that chip in my head. It's just I have no memories of it needing to be used in any way. When I was with Nagbafen, I went with the program. Um, I had some issues when I was with Nagbafen, but they were generally calling me a miscabert and they because I was female, there were always the sexual pressures and uh, they have many, many more male than female officers and you're not allowed to fraternize. So the few female officers there, there are, not only did you have your normal duties, but you also were expected to service the males. And some of them were obnoxious as hell and I would eventually tell them no, and I would get in trouble. With me, each of the women I remember being with out there, and I've met each of them here, they all remember me. I rem at least one of them doesn't remember the relationship the other two do. There's three that I remember. Well, one of them was my commanding officer. Um, on, well, I, it might have been on Mars. Anyway, I remember having a drawn out relationship with each of them. It wasn't like a one night stand. Well, I have uh, 91, 60 and backs and almost countless 20 and backs. And out of those, there were two of the 20 and backs where I was de facto the mistress of the commander. And those were long-term relationships and the commander, the, the commanding officer chose me, not vice versa. Um, For those who are going to look at me and as I am at 65 years old and say, yeah, right, somebody picked you. You were 21. I was 21 to 25 in appearance, and I have not always been old and ugly. For everybody <laughs> watching this, they use the regen tanks to keep the girls at between 21 and 25 mm -hmm. and the guys between 30 and 35. Exactly. So... You can be, for all practical purposes, 300 years old, and you will still look 25 maximum. So um, they have people of all different ages in there together, and nobody cares because we all look and feel that age range. Eventually, the regen tank does... Um it's like you're eventually your genetics can no longer be regenerated. Mm. It takes an extreme amount of time to reach that point. Well, and I, every species is, is, has a different um, um, amount of time that their genetics is capable of being regenerated with that technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, those that have been, those trips that I've been put into clone bodies, they had to use a different kind of regen technology because otherwise you end up with the clones the mind. And, medical pod. Yeah, you have to have that. And uh, so those incarnate, those trips don't count against the regen limit. Um, but yeah. They, they can keep, we go through regen on a regular basis because the drugs, they, the drugs, they keep us to keep us at top shape, destroy our liver and kidneys. They'll kill us within a month. Yeah. You'll die from regenerated every couple of weeks. You have to be regenerated on a regular schedule just to keep those, you alive. Those drugs are increasing our intelligence, memory capacity, our, um, our stamina and endurance, our muscle capacity, um, yeah, bone so, and bone and muscle density. 
Yeah, they're they're basically using us more like robotics rather than people. And the drugs allow that to happen. And there's enough chips that that interface has to be protected too. So um, it, it, it gets kind of interesting sometimes when I think about, especially when I was in Kruger, I had so many enhancements that to look at me, you wouldn't even tell there was a human underneath anymore. So um, Kruger is what the Borg and Star Trek were based on. So I, know I have one altar at least that's in Kruger. I have some memories of being on a planet um, wearing that damn exoskeleton that's bolted to your your bone skeleton. Mm -hmm. uh, that thing is so fucking painful. It is. Um, it the movie Elysium does not do the real thing justice. No, and I had an altar that had one of those, and it was so painful, it bled onto me real world, and I kept going to the doctor, why do I have this pain right at my SI joints? Well, that's where the bottom of it was attached, surgically. Was into that's that. This, everybody <clears throat> watching this, the movie Elysium was specifically Kruger technology disclosure. Yes, it was. It was everything, Kruger. everything in there was Kruger tech. Yes, and it was amazing that the one character was actually named Kruger. It was like. Let's put this in neon for everybody to see. <laughs> yep. Yes. So it was it was an interesting movie to say the least. You're watching Matt Damon be one of us. Pretty much. And they also have use the technology to download computer information into your head and then upload it into another machine. And yes, sometimes they kill us in the process. I remember, I actually have a memory of being on strapped to something and my limbs being cut off of me. It's, it, it was almost like, it was almost like that scene out of Quake 4 when the main character, the video game Quake 4. It, I don't, I don't story. play any of the, them. The whole video game series of Quake is what they're doing to cyborgs on Mars. Okay. That's what that is. And in this memory, I remember, I actually, I just remember it's like my whole body just being. I don't know what they did with the parts. But I have memory of that. So maybe I was turned into, I had one altar turned into a cyborg or something. I don't know. Uh, I know I had one altar that was turned into a cyborg. Uh, she shuttles, she shuttles a transport ship between the moon and Mars, and that's all she does, back and forth. And they at least put a, put hair on her, in a ponytail, so that in mo that era the cyborgs mostly had an acrylic clear covering over their brain so that you knew they were a cyborg and not a robot but they they put hair over that on her so but when i've bled over into her she has only the awareness of awake or asleep and all of her actual memories are stored in the AI portion of, of the cyborg. I remember waking up one morning to that memory just kind of surfacing as I was waking up. That was intense. 
It yeah. Was, yeah. Waking it was hard up, waking to deal up. With in that moment. It waking was like up just, to having waking up in my bed, and then all of a sudden I have this this memory surfacing of ha of having body parts removed, ripped off. Yeah, um, cut into with saw blades, and no painkillers. No painkillers. No, the excuse being, well, they won't remember it anyway. That's a lie. I know it's a lie. It lies we tell ourselves. It's a lie it, they tell themselves. Well, some some of the people who have come forward are some of those people. Oh. Uh, you know? That's something that even the folks, the veterans have trouble with is that the techs the programmers the all of those us. they're all the same as us they're all slaves just like we are yeah the people that are coming in the ships to our houses and abducting us they're in this program too against their will and those are alters doing somebody's bidding exactly to do so oh i know one of the people that that came to pick they came to pick me up for for years and um she's a on earth she's a very sweet person and once and you, you vet uh pretty much everybody uh through her and ask you know her uh was this one of the people you used to take yeah um i did and that that's for, how you vetted me yeah it was um, it was yeah. shocking when I, when you told me that it was shocking, but I've I've come to accept it that she's, you know, just as much of a slave as as I am. Yeah, but we can't tell who she is because not only would she be targeted by the public, but she would be targeted by the veterans because how dare you come get me? But that's just her assignment. She had no, she had no control over it, and there it, was. There is no ability to say no. Yeah. You're brainwashed, programmed. You're you're literally an organic cyborg robot. You're programmed to do a job. And if and you don't you, and then when you're sent back, you've got these memories that you have to deal with about what you did. Yeah. Exactly. And you're sitting here, you know that you're one of these people, but you also know what you did out there is going to make these people mad at you. Right. So what do you do? She came forth quietly and privately to me. And at least she has somebody to talk to. And no, I'm not going to out who she is because she has every right to be private about it. I felt honored and tr that she trusted me. So, yeah. At least you have somebody to talk to. Uh, I couldn't imagine not having anybody to talk to. I did for, well, when I first came out, I started looking for people that not came out. When I, uh, when I first started remembering, I, start, I started looking for people to talk to. But before that, it was just, I thought I was just an abductee. And I didn't even know there was anybody to talk to. Well, I remember. Then I started remembering being on a bridge of a ship and being in these programs and being in the pilot seat of a fighter craft and mm -hmm. doing all this training. And I'm like, and then I started remembering the mind fracturing, the torture. Someone yeah, it, it, you, you just, get it. I wasn't you, just abducted. You get these things together and, and you start remembering this, that, and the other, and you're going, whoa, wait a minute. I wasn't just picked up by ETs, although my memories were not ETs at all. Mine were humans in uniforms, or worse, humans in reptilian costumes with zippers. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> 
as that far was, as me, that was just I've like... come to understand that I've been taken by both parties. Um, I've been taken and humans. I've been taken mostly by humans. Um, I've been taken by ETs in the last three years. When I was a kid, I used to have this reoccurring nightmare of these grays surrounding my bed, me floating up over the bed, and then going straight through the window with the window still closed. Um, now the window's in the middle of the room. My bed's off to the side wall. I remember in the memory, I remember floating over sideways to the middle of the room then going through the window. And then I started really meditating. I used a technique that um, that Tony Rodriguez um, taught me. And I started using it on that memory. And I started noticing this little thing starting to happen. It was almost like like a like a desert mirage type of shimmery mm -hmm. elements started disappearing and then suddenly the grays were gone and there's this guy human guy in black military clothing standing there yeah and he it, it, his elements of him was switching between rolled up sleeves and sleeve down having a beret on his head and having no beret on his head um buttoned up all the way to the top um collar or the top button open you know it's just little simple things like that mm -hmm. uh, i started noticing that it's because all all of the memories of of this repeated occurrence were all jumbled up into one spot of my brain yeah um i've noticed that when you have the same occurrence of memory happening many times. When you're experiencing the same thing occur many times, the brain will consolidate all of those elements in a full yes. frequency, combine them together. And then when you go back to look at them, you're looking at one memory, but the elements that are different between the memory switch. They flutter back and forth. Yeah, uh, that's something that that people haven't addressed. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, when you have multiple occurrences of a of similar events, for me it was green fatigues. It was reptilian suits with zippers. It was. <clears throat> it was the tan fatigues and that was before they had the uh the ability to alter your memory to show something else and then well it's been the last decade or so it's been black fatigues yeah. with no insignias which i assume that means cia rather than military that's what I made the assumption of. So that was uh, my childhood was all black fatigues, is what they were wearing. No insignias, solid black um, military fatigues. Sometimes the guy would have a beret on his head. Sometimes he wouldn't. Yeah. Sometimes the top button would be buttoned. Sometimes it wouldn't. Sometimes the short the the sleeves would be rolled up, and sometimes they'd be down. Yeah. Well. I've I've lived in this apartment for over 15 years and I get the memory of a red circular portal at the top of the stairs only it's sideways to the, to where the stairs come up so it's like opening and going directly into my bedroom what so, happened with me was once the memory, once the real memory uh, came back, I would wake up and there would be this guy at the corner of my bed. And he would, there, there, was, always, there was always this silver looking wristband and he would press a spot on the wristband 
suddenly I would float up and go straight through the wall. Mm. And it's like I phased straight through the wall. Um, and I remember suddenly being outside under this bright light. It was like this beam of light just shining down. And I remember looking up at the, at the light and around it was this big black triangle. And I remember looking back at my house, the red brick on the, of, of the wall and him walking right through the wall to the base of where that white light was. When he stopped at the base, I started moving up towards the, the black triangle. Mm. Well, I, I don't remember what the ship looks like, but I remember there being sometimes as many uh, as four of these people in, in the black fatigues coming to get me. And everybody in the apartment is asleep except me. And they don't seem to care whether I'm asleep or not. But apparently I fight that they have to have that many. Which you would think if all of these free will people were correct that me fighting would say, hell no, I don't want to go. You don't have my consent. But that doesn't seem to matter. I get taken anyway. I remember when I was a kid, one of my friend's 12th birthdays, he was down the street at the corner of the street. We, me and a whole bunch of the other kids, we all slept over at his house. And one night, um, the other kids were doing stuff and we were off by ourselves, just me and him, um, just talking. And he just suddenly opens up and tells me the story about one time he saw this black triangle moving down the street over over the over the houses. And guess whose house is down the street? Yours. Well, I and think his parents we, didn't believe him. I think we are just about at our time. So thank you for coming. Oh, you're welcome. And this will air. This will air on uh, the 20th, I think. And yeah, it'll air on the 20th. And we pre recorded this because I'm going to be at 5D events in Las Vegas for the weekend and thank you so much for your time.